What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment what I saw these young African Americans doing was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this Cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up. And to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the Cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes. And I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. My name is Novella Ford and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions. And thank you for joining us here in Harlem as well as those who are online. I'm gonna ask everyone if you could here in the auditorium uh, to silence your cell phones. And if you're looking to share tonight's conversation with others, it can be viewed online at youtube.com forward slash the Schomburg Center. Again, that's youtube.com forward slash the Schomburg Center. Before I go into the rest of my remarks for tonight, I just want to lift up, um, what is happening here? <laughs> and is it safe? Because that sounded like the sound that happens when <laughs> we're all supposed to pick up and get out of here. But before I go for, forward, as we, as there are some remarks that I'm going to make that this will make sense to, but today uh, was the New York Public Library's um, library award, librarian awards uh, that are given out to librarians and archivists and people and the, the staff of the New York Public Library. Um, and this was somebody who I came across as I was doing some research and always try to bring the archives into our conversations. And there was a librarian whose name was Priota Belpri, who was Afro-Puerto Rican, um, who was the first Latina to become a librarian here at the New York Public Library. She was also the first librarian to create a bilingual story time um, at one of the branches. First, she worked here at the 135th Street Library, which was the original library where the Schomburg Collection was donated. Uh, and then she went on to work at 115th Street uh, Library, which became the Harry Belafonte li Library. And then as the Spanish-speaking community that was residing in Harlem moved eastward, she also moved eastward. So let's just give a round of applause to Pura Belpri the first Latina librarian here at the New York Public Library. Through conversations, performances, film screenings, exhibitions, and more, we explore historical and contemporary narratives that continue to shape Harlem, this nation, and the world. Next week, we have two programs that I think you don't want to miss. As many of you know, this year marks the 50th anniversary of hip hop, an art form that has shaped my adolescence as well as college years and continues its influence over the world. The legendary MC Chuck D of Public Enemy will join us on Monday for a conversation and preview screening of his PBS series, Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World. The next day, on January 24th, we celebrate the birth of our founder and namesake, historian and scholar Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Our annual lecture and conversation illuminates, the scholars, illuminates scholars whose work reflects the vision of, of Arturo Schomburg. The lecture will feature Dr. Deborah Willis, who is the university professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. And she is the author of The Black Civil War Soldier, A Visual History of Conflict and Citizenship. Dr. Willis's latest book explores the crucial role of photography in retelling and shaping African-American narratives of the Civil War. Dr. Willis was also the first curator of the Schomburg Center's Photographs and Prints Division, and we are excited to have her join us next week. And speaking of Photographs and Prints Division, and as also mentioned that today was uh, staff awards at the library, I'm asking you to join me in a round of applause for my colleague, Michael Mary, who has served the Schomburg for over 30 years in the Photographs and Prints Division. Please give him a round of applause. Today, he was awarded the NYPL Bertha Franklin Fetter for out, Bertha Franklin Fetter Award for Outstanding Service in Librarianship. And next week, he will enter retirement, and he will be sorely missed. I invite you to learn more about the Schomburg Center and our upcoming programs by visiting our website at schomburg.org. We will also have um, public program brochures available starting sometime next week if you want to learn more about what we have going on and are not able to access us uh, online. I mentioned before that our founder, Arturo, our founder, Arturo Schomburg, and it surprises many people when I tell them that he was an Afro-Puerto Rican. I think it's the surname that trips them up. But he is someone who talked about facing a certain kind of erasure growing up where he was told as an Afro-Puerto Rican that, at least on the black side, his people had no history. And so how does that kind of erasure turn into discrimination or racism? 
and intercultural bias. I read, Dr. Tanya, I read Professor Tanya Hernandez's book as I was traveling to the Dominican Republic, and I always think about the expulsion of Haitians from the DR side of the island that they share. Later in the headlines, there were the former Los Angeles City Council President Nuri Martinez and her anti-black remarks towards her other council member. And just thinking, anti-blackness is not the realm of the few or even the other. It can be found in our communities where we share the same cultural background. Racial innocence, unmasking Latino anti-black bias and struggle for equality is described as the first comprehensive book about anti-black bias in the Latino community that unpacks the misconception that Latinos are exempt from racism due to their ethnicity, ethnicity, ethnicity and multicultural background. We are pleased to have Professor Tanya Quetere Hernandez, author of Racial Innocence, join us today to discuss this important issue with Professor Penelope Andrews, the John Marshall Harlan II Professor of Law and Director of the Racial Justice Project at New York Law School. She is also a South African human rights activist and expert on racial justice across the globe. Professor Hernandez is an internationally recognized comparative race law expert and a professor of law at Fordham University School of Law where she teaches anti-discrimination law, comparative employment discrimination, and critical race theory. A Fulbright Scholar, Princeton, and Rutgers Fellow, and a former scholar in residence at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, she specializes, she specializes in comparative race relations and anti-discrimination law. Copies of Racial Innocence, which you see on the screen, some of you may already have, are available in the Schomburg shop. And Professor Hernandez will join us for a book signing following the discussion, as well as we will have time for an audience Q&A. Please welcome Professor Hernandez, who will first read from her book. And Penelope Andrews will then join her in conversation. Please welcome her now. Thank you very much for that warm welcome and that lovely introduction, Novella. Uh, it's a true honor to be here with you today. I um, have a very special place in my heart for Arturo Schomburg. He is, in many ways, almost like a spiritual mentor. Um, and be, being a former Schomburg Fellow, it's always nice to come back home. So I'm going to read a short excerpt from the book. Penny and I will talk a little bit, and then you all can join in with us. Latinos can be racist. Some may be startled to hear this. After all, our national conversations about racism appear oblivious to this fact. That's before the LA City Council. Huh? And some civil rights leaders are also seemingly reticent to air the dirty laundry of the bias that exists within communities of color, lest it distract from the so-called real racism of white supremacy. However, all the while, Afro-Latinos and African-Americans suffer from discrimination at the hands of Latinos who claim that their racially mixed cultures immunize them from being racist. I call this the Latino racial innocence cloak that veils Latino complicity in US racism. In turn, public ignorance about Latino anti-blackness undermines the ability to fully address the interwoven complexities of US racism in developing public policies and enforcing anti-discrimination law. Judges, in addition to the rest of society, need to learn that Latinos can be prejudiced toward both Afro-Latinos and African Americans. When I tell people that part of my research is on the topic of anti-blackness in Latino communities and explain, yes, that is a thing. Light-skinned and fair-skinned Latinos often react by telling me that Latinos and African Americans get along and frequently live in neighboring areas or the very same buildings. In other words, they're conveying that they do not believe anti-blackness is a real issue in Latino communities, at least not like it is in white non-Hispanic communities. While it would certainly be ideal 
if Latinos were all truly colorblind and incapable of committing racist acts? As an Afro-Latina myself, I do not have the luxury of indulging in the fantasy of a Latino racial mixture utopia. As I share in the epilogue of the book, the visibility of my family's black ancestry means I literally have skin in the game of accurately assessing the operation of racism in its many forms. Consequently, this book excavates the voices of Afro-Latinos and African-Americans who have actually experienced Latino anti-black bias in an effort to help disrupt the public ignorance and Latino disinclination to grapple with Latino anti-blackness. However, anti-black racism that arises outside the unfortunately familiar US frame of white non-Hispanic versus African-American bias can be mystifying for many people. This is in part because US blackness is primarily conceived of as embodied solely by English-speaking African-Americans. In turn, anti-blackness is properly understood as a uniquely US phenomena affecting those English-speaking African-Americans with occasional recognition of the racialized struggles of Africans and others in the African diaspora. This skewed vision is only compounded by how Latino communities themselves marginalize or entirely erase the existence of Afro-Latinos. Hidden from view is the way Latino disregard for blackness plays a role in the subordinated status of Afro-Latinos and in turn, the exclusion of African-Americans. Latino workplace supervisors deny both groups of blacks access to promotions and wage increases. Latino homeowners turn away black prospective tenants and home purchasers. Latino restaurant workers block black customers from entry and refuse to serve them. Latino students bully and harass black students. Latino educators belittle black students. Latino police officers assault and kill blacks. Most heinous are the Latinos who join violent white power organizations and harm blacks. However, even when Latinos do not racially identify as white like white supremacists, their identities as solely Latino do not mitigate the aforementioned instances of anti-blackness, all of which I deal to detail in the book. What drove me to persist with the painstaking hunt for the narratives of discrimination when so many Latinos instead suggest that Latino anti-blackness does not merit deep exploration. My family history, again, as an Afro-Latina, would not permit otherwise. This is because embodying blackness within a Latino family can so deeply ground one in the materiality of Latino bias that fantasies of Latino colorblind unity are unable to interfere with the questioning of Latino racial attitudes. More about that and everybody else's story in the book. So good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to people at Schaumburg here for inviting me to engage with you in this conversation. And I want to tell you in the audience that you really should buy the book uh, from my perspective for many reasons. But to start the conversation, I will mention just three. Uh, the first is, is that it's a highly accessible, accessible well-written, clear, engaging book. It's free of jargon and really, really very thoughtful. Um, the second is, is that I'm a South African, a black South African classified as colored. And so the book resonated so strongly with me because we talk about, the book is about um, anti-black sentiment in the Latino community in the United States 
Um, but it could have been written for South Africa. We, we do talk about blackness, but there was an institutionalized systemic system of racial hierarchy, mostly based on skin color, um, and which persists to this day. So I, I thought that, that you, uh, you captured so much of what's personal to me and what we haven't really um, necessarily articulated so, so elegantly. And then also, if you look at the phenomenon that you're talking about, um, it's a global phenomenon. You can go to India and look at um, racial and you know, sort of color hierarchies. It's no accident that Brahmins are light-skinned and the Dalits, the so-called untouchables, are dark-skinned. And everywhere else we see this. So I thought that the book resonated very much with me, both because of its local content, but also globally. And then the third reason, and I'm just going to be the start of my uh, questions with you, is I want to start by what you, what you do very early on in the book, and that is locate the source of uh, racist tendencies in a, in a private space, and that's in the family. Um, you articulate so well you know, how in the family we first learn about racism, whether it's the texture of our hair, um, the, in South Africa, for example, you know, the size of our lips, uh, a range in the family is where people's identity is shaped and notions of, in, of racial inferiority are born. So I thought that you articulated that so very, very well. And it's hard because it's candid and it's airing dirty linen in public. But I think if we're going to have a conversation about race and anti-black racism, then we need to, the bias, we need to take it at its core. So, and, 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 and before I ask the question, I just also want to highlight, what you highlight, we insist on this binary of thinking about race just in terms of black-white racism, and, and, it, and we, we really, there are many permutations. So the question that I want to ask you is, is uh, if the private spaces of our families, as you point out, are the first places where individuals confront their identities and their sense of racial inferiority, then it seems like the law is almost a feckless instrument. So, because it's deep in the culture and deep in the psyche, and law has its limitations. So, what role for the law when Racism is fortified in private spaces where often the law cannot reach. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who, who don't have any knowledge about the book, I think part of Penny's question for me is emanating from the fact that I use cases, law cases, to talk about many of these issues. Um, but I have to be very um, uh, honest <laughs> uh, that I used the cases for a reason that's different than how a law professor <laughs> would otherwise think about cases. Right? So meaning the, the book is not dedicated to like thinking about um, how should we re-envision the role of law. Right? Um, the cases are there as another source of storytelling. Right? In, in many respects, the cases are there as almost like a literary device. Right? Um, and the reason why I did this is because Latinos are so often, not all of us, but so resistant culturally to talking about anti-blackness. And there's always a but, a pero, 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 pero. There's, it's always about something else. It's never really about racism, et cetera, right? We have like a whole list of justifications for why it's not the real deal. And so what I wanted to do was to show the ways in which when victims of Latino anti-blackness tell their own stories, because many of these cases, there's no lawyer present, right? They, they represent themselves. Um, so they're unvarnished stories when they come and they tell the, uh, um, their narratives. It helps disrupt this racial innocence because it's like, stop the nonsense. Right? Here are countless stories within schools right? with Latino principals imposing disparate discipline based on the skin color of the, of the child. Latino supervisors in workplaces, Latino uh, homeowners, right? I mean, the, the, the list right, of all the spaces in which anti-discrimination law seeks to speak and 
pursue a uh, more egalitarian society, in all of those spaces, there are uh, Latinos who are being called to account for their anti-blackness. Right? So that's the main reason and use of the cases. At the same time, while I was going to those cases to be able to sort of like have a concrete place to draw from, because, because these conversations are so taboo, other than in people's memoirs, there's not like a lot of documentation, right? There's growing now, a lot of young Afro-Latino, Afro-Latina scholars doing great work, but this has not traditionally been the case. Um, and so having the law cases was a way to have like a hard, concrete sort of manifestation, you know, a, a pattern uh, to be able to share with people. But as I was doing that, what I did see, and this was a more sort of the, the role of law, was that anti-discrimination law works, when, when it's applied, it works just fine, right? <laughs> you know, um, what it doesn't work is when judges look at Latinos and give them an off-ramp, right? And the off-ramp is they are drinking the Kool-Aid of Latino exceptionality with regard to anti-blackness, right? Not all of them, but enough of them to make it scary to me, right? And so the book also provides a commentary for them, like meaning, wake up, you know? This is not an exception to black-white binary. Often people view me as like, oh, are you trying to say that it, we'd be talking about white and black fat people and black people too much? No, what I'm saying, this is white and black too. And that Latino anti-blackness is part of white supremacy. It's not another version, it's not a beige version, it's white supremacy. Huh? <laughs> And so when judges say, oh, this person who's accused of discrimination, I've got you know, examples of this, uh, is saying that they are racially mixed and that they have family of all different skin shades, you know, which may or may not be the truth, but let's say that it's the truth, right? And that that itself means that they cannot be biased, that they cannot have been complicit in anti-blackness, that is problematic from a law perspective, right? So, Mine is less a commentary about what law can't do and more about trying to say, apply the same law, but apply it. Right? Now, that being the case, I do start off with the family, right? where law doesn't speak pretty much at all. Right? But the reason why I start with the family is because in using the cases as a mode of sort of disrupting Latino uh, racial innocence about these matters, uh, I wanted to show the ways in which, as I, I say in the book, the family is the scene of the crime. Right? This is the place where not only are people's racial identities formed, but also the rules of engagement of anti-blackness are taught. Right? So, you know, the focus on good hair and bad hair, right? Uh, the focus on don't stay out in the sun too long. Like all of those modes, right, are ways in which we let our young people know, right, that blackness is problematic, right? or that it only has a particular space in which it is appropriate to acknowledge. Dancing, singing, you know, like we can entertain you with our blackness, right? But we cannot be viewed as inherently intellectual, capable, worthy otherwise. Right? I mean, the, the restricted spheres in which blackness is allowed to be able to be acknowledged within the culture right? uh, is itself a commentary about our anti-blackness. Um, and so that's why I started with the family. Now that being said, I think it is useful right, to be able to talk about the family stuff when we think about law. Right? Um, because too often, right, this idea of, oh, but this is not about us, this is not about us, is also what keeps people from going to court and then spouting their nonsense right, uh, as a mode of defense in court itself. So, I mean, if we think about the, this way of disrupting the family uh, articulation of anti-blackness, we can better enable law to be able to do the little bit of good it can do to be able to do it. Yes. Thank you. So I want to push you then on this point of law. And, you know, the cases that you mention in the book, housing, employment, a range of cases in which black people are subjected uh, to racism. So you, you want to educate judges. So I want to push you on this question of legal remedies because it seems that 
you state in your book that um, Afro-Latinos uh, as a group can be an enigma, almost puzzling to US courts because courts see blacks solely as a reference to African Americans. And then of course, Similarly, the courts also, judges seem to see the expression of racial bias by la Latinos. They misread that because what they, they see is, they sort of negotiate this as a racial problem um, that is to go back to the sort of black-white binary. But they, if it's gonna be a strategy towards elimination, how do you think judges should react and how should the law respond with a remedy by not giving Latinos an off -land? How do you then incorporate that into a legal remedy? Right. Um, for me, what it was important to sort of like lay out in the book, um, it, it, almost implicitly, but you know, um, was the idea of judges need to be taught, right? just like the rest of us. And right now, they are racially illiterate with, with respect to Latino anti-blackness. There's lots of other stuff they're racially illiterate about, but this is my focus. I hope there are no judges. <laughs> I hope there are no judges. <laughs> oh, I know, really. <laughs> <laughs> the, the few judges are here, I'm sure, are an exception. <laughs> um, and so in trying to provide the, the antidote right, uh, to that racial illiteracy, I mean, try to help them become racially literate. It's also a guideline for litigators. Right? A litigator, I mean, you know, the lawyers who go into court and handle these cases, right? It, this is like a little guidebook for them to be able to go seek expert witnesses. Right? All my sisters and brothers who I cite in the book, because it's chock full of citations in the back, right? Um, because people, or as my, my children say to me, you know, mommy, you bring in the receipts. That's right, I'm bringing the receipts. Um, so that people have the receipts already, right? They're already filed away. Um, you know, by different category, education, housing, public accommodations, et cetera. Um, and they can know who to call for act being expert witnesses, right? Um, there's a way in which you can enter into the legal space and not only tell the facts of what happened uh, to your client, but also give the wider landscape for understanding those facts. Right? That's part of lawyering, right? Um, what I want the book to be able to do is uh, at the same time that it's part of the, sort of the public discourse, right? it's not written just for the lawyers, um, but it does provide the lawyers a nice, easy to use reference point for being able to better situate the facts for judges to appreciate what they're saying, right? To understand it, that this, is too, this too is about whiteness and blackness. And so then if, you know, to just pivot a little bit, if, you know, there's, the, as you point out in your book, the anti-black bias, the case studies you have, if we think about major legal actors in this country and particularly in the city, the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, these are coalitions of people of color. If there is this you know, bias Within, we don't know the proportion of the population. You seem to suggest it's a minority. Mm. Um, although, you know, uh, um, if one looks, for example, at the, uh, the reporting about the rise of Latinos in the Republican Party, so that, that sort of those, those, those numbers, I, I don't know what to make of that, but you, so we don't know the numbers. But so the question for me really is, how do we form legal and political coalitions in the face of you know what what you've you unearthed in the book, mm -hmm. because the assumption is that when we talk about anti-discrimination law, and when we talk about uh, racial equality, it's assumed that these coalitions are going to work towards the same goal. But you know your book seems to suggest that there may may actually be those kinds of tensions that make coalitions not possible mm -hmm. or fragile. Mm -hmm. Well. First, I want to be able to say, before y'all just jump on me during a Q&A, right? Uh, yes, and keep your, we're, we're going to go to you for questions, so think about the question. The book does acknowledge right, that we do work in coalition, right? That historically, Latinos, Afri well, Latinos, an un, 
mediated racial grouping, right? You know, I'll, I'll use the, the, the terms of the debate, you know, as it exists, uh, impoverished as it is, right? So Latinos um, and African Americans have had uh, coalitions, continue to have coalitions, and, you know, work jointly towards social justice, right? However, uh, in my view, and, you know, based on the research, part of what makes those coalitions so fragile is that Latino anti-blackness is not being examined by Latinos themselves, okay? And so they'll act out. So I'll give you an example from the book. Here's a freebie, but you all don't have to buy this book for the dinner. <laughs> um, I, I, and then that gives me an opportunity to also add that the book not only does cases, but it um, uh, uses interviews, right? So I interview uh, different stakeholders in each of those categories, you know, housing, education, the workplace, et cetera, right? Um, in order to help kind of give greater texture uh, and an understanding for what all those uh, victims fighting in court are trying to kind of intervene into. So one of the interviews, or a couple of them, were of civil rights lawyers. Right? Uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, Latino Justice, Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, and what came up? Because sometimes you start these interviews, you already think, well, I know what the answers are gonna be, and then they like, they come up with you with something else, and you're like, whoa, I just learned something new. So here was a something new that I learned. Right? That the uh, civil rights organizations, our leading civil rights organizations, have had some difficulties with regards to voting rights redistricting issues. Right? Long story short, right? we want to be able to have voting rights districts right, that help facilitate people of color elect candidates of their choice, whatever race those people may be. One way to enhance our voting rights power is to form what are called unity maps. Right? That's where you have a district that crosses different you know, zones in order to have people of color be able to count together as a district to like double up on their voting power. Right? So we don't get like you know washed out by the majority right? okay. of voting folks. And here's what the new thing that I learned despite unity mapping being something that, you know, is like beneficial for us as people of color, what these civil rights attorneys have had to confront are the ways in which at the community organization meetings, maybe some of y'all were in them, right? At the community, community um, um, meetings, in order to sort of get this forward and get, um, and get buy-in, Latino anti-blackness is running amok, right? Meaning, despite the fact that it would be in the best interest, right, of many Latinos to go forward with unity mapping, they are busy wanting to socially distance themselves with their commentary and whatnot, like, you know, no, not with them. And no, we want our own. I mean, this is sort of resonates, right, with the Nuri Martinez's um, uh, LA City Council stuff. But it's, that, it's, but here's what I want to underscore. It is not just about politicians doing their politicking, you know, that it's not just about the power grab, right, that, um, you know, special interest group politics, uh, you know, devolves into. It's also informed by anti-blackness. Right? So if Latinos themselves are not doing this introspection about how Afro-Latinos are at the bottom of the pecking order, how people who are of indigenous ancestry also don't get quite a fair shake within the community, et cetera, if we're not doing that internalized work, then the attempts to do coalition right, are inherently going to be fragile because our nonsense is gonna come out and display, right? Because we haven't dealt with it within the um, community itself. Um, so that being said, um, I do believe that sort of this intersectional, like, like looking at race and ethnicity together, right? That Latinos have a race, that they're not, that, that being Latino itself is not a race, uh, helps illuminate right? the way in which Attending to the internal levels of subordination, we can be better partners and allies. Right? I mean, I guess the best way to kind of give an analogy is sort of like, you know, somebody is treating their spouse like trash at home on, along gender lines. That's not necessarily the person you're going to think is going to be a great partner when it comes to issues of coalition on, uh, you know, gender subordination. You know, the, the personal and the, poli the political do often, you know, go hand in hand. Uh, and so part of this personal is also the personal of how we deal with our own internalized issues. Um. So yes, I just, you just, your, your comments made me, reminded me um, 
about, you know, you're talking about it within communities, within organizations, this is not being discussed. But I wonder if I can add a kind of optimistic, a hopeful note, because I've, if, I think the movie was West Side Story. I mm -hmm. think the remake of West Side Story. There was a huge controversy because the actors were chosen, too many of the actors were light-skinned and not dark-skinned. I think that was the movie, right? Well, actually, I knew. But was it um, there, there, was was some, it? there was some stuff about that one, but I, I'm, I'm a black Twitter, yes. too. Uh, and so, <laughs> the, 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 the story within the story was that preceding West Side Story, there was In the Heights. Uh, in the Heights it was. That Our was fellow Twitterers. Yes yes, yes, yes. And so within the Heights, Lynn manuel Miranda, right? Great with Hamilton, but what ha happened, right? Uh, <laughs> with regards to In the Heights, is that there was this paucity, right? Of people of darker skin. Uh, and when, you know, he, when the issue got raised, right? Uh, and his um, response was, but there are people of color. And then here's like, you know, the deeper analysis, right? But where were the dark people uh, on screen? Shaking their behinds, right? Singing a song, they're in the background, right? I mean, they weren't key players, right? They were, and this is more than just about the usual Hollywood problems with casting, right? This is about how do we, um, with respect, portray a community that's black, right? Uh, and so this erasure um, was what he was being called to account for. Um, West Side Story had his own little issues, uh, but the real colorism question came up with In the Heights. And, and you didn't ask this, but I, I, I can't help myself. I want to add this other part. Uh, all the people say to me, oh, yes, you know, color, that's such a problem within the Latino community and other communities, whatever, as if they had nothing to do with anti-blackness, right? That it was just about aesthetics, that it's about, like, who we date or don't want to date, who we marry, who we don't want to bring home to the parents, that sort of thing. Don't get me wrong, that's problematic too, right, to have those biases, um, but it, that almost devolves into this role of, uh, oh, that's just about aesthetics, or about like, you know, who you find interesting as a romantic partner, as opposed to colorism is not something separate and apart from anti-blackness. It's not just any old color that we have problems with. We have a problem with darker color as it's marching us way to Mother Africa, right? Uh, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's also, this is all, all the other example I had to bring too, that when people say, oh, it's really about color. No, because within the Latino community, we have a full architecture of language that has nothing to do about your skin shade, but is everything about anti-blackness. So we have a whole list of words about, if you like skin, you could pass for white, ah, but you got the nose, or you got the hair. We have a whole nomenclature. There's a taxonomy, right, for those different categories. That's not about color, right, but it's about blackness, right? racialized blackness. Uh, uh, and so the um, conversation about In the Heights was one that, w for the most part, was portrayed as about, oh, you know, brother got a skin color problem. This is more than that, right? Because this is also a commentary about how the anti-blackness is internalized. So, so they, that it makes you blind, like you can't even see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, in you, you focus in your book quite a bit on this, the rise of right-wing extremism in this country and the apparent grip on, um, you know, conservative politics. And you mention um, Latino actors in the movie. You mentioned, for example, Michael Ramos and his role in the, mm -hmm. in the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally. Uh, Nick Fuentes, you also look this outright person. Um, and you point out that the po Southern Poverty Law Center has noted that there is a disturbing trend of more Latinos joining white supremacist hate groups. Um, so if we, if we think about the quest uh, for racial equality and attempts to eradicate racism, how do we deal with the, the challenge of 
Latinos who carry the banner of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. If you look at, for example, January the 6th, you see some of the actors there as well, which does raise some really challenging questions. It, it most certainly does. You know, and what's interesting to me is that, um, you know, as newspapers have gotten more um, attuned to covering the Latinos involved in the white supremacist organizations, you know, the head of the Proud Boys, Enrique Tarrio, uh, part of the January 6th uh, conspiracy, um, indicted and convicted. Uh, what gets missed is that this is not new, right? Meaning that if we, if people had like a, a connection to folks who are on the inside, right, they would have had a better understanding about the way in which Latino uh, white supremacists are a thing, right? So what I mean by that is this: uh, the prisons are spaces that are even more segregated uh, than us on the outside. So for folks on the inside, there are clear demarcations, right? And if you violate those demarcations, the whites, the African-Americans, or anybody who gets counted as black, right? Uh, and this odd middle space of Latino, right? You're gonna get dealt with, right? Violently by the various groups. Now, when prison riots happen, and they do, right? Latinos make a choice, a concerted choice, time and time again, to throw their lot in with the white supremacists. I mean, they don't have to do that, they choose that. Right? They also police one another, so when the new folks come in, don't you do anything with those black people. Don't you have anything to do with those uh, African Americans. Right? So if folks had had a better understanding or communication, rather than cutting themselves off, for, uh, off from the lives of people who are incarcerated, they would have had an insight into the ways in which Latino white supremacy has long been sort of this a problematic dynamic, right? Um, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, the uh, attack on the Capitol on January 6th, my two year anniversary, um, these are spaces in which, you know, it spills out onto the streets, right? Outside, but it has long been festering. Now, well, you didn't ask me, Penny, but sort of often lurking in people's minds is like, but why would the like KKK types let them in? <laughs> like, how, you know, some of us Latinos don't, you know, even if we might identify as white, right? Um, or passe blanc, right? Uh, like if you were in New Orleans or something, uh, they don't necessarily look white to white supremacists, right? So how is that the case? Well, sometimes politics can be quite pragmatic. Right? Uh, and so white supremacists have noted, right, that they are declining in numbers, right? You know, the census uh, keeps track <laughs> of the white non-Hispanics, and those numbers are going down. Huh? So as long as you are uh, someone who says you, that you may be mixed, but none of your mixture comes from African sources, so if you, do, you play that game of, oh, I'm only Taino, right, you know. Uh, <laughs> The, then, right, then the white supremacists are like, well, okay, as long as you sign on to our manifestos, right? So if you are down with anti-blackness, then you can be part of the group, right? Because they don't have enough numbers. Right? And so this is what lets them go attack the Capitol in large numbers, because they've got these uh, white identifying uh, Latinos with them, despite the fact like if you take a look at that picture of the Proud Boys guy, Enrique Tarrio, that ain't quite white. Yeah? Uh, but, you yeah, know, the mind is a powerful space. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And we don't know whether, we don't know whether it's false consciousness or not, but you know, right. the mind is a, mm -hmm. you're a very engaged audience and I know you've been sitting listening to us. Uh, are there, it's gonna be time for you to ask questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna ask maybe one question. If you have any questions, you can think about lining up, I think they're, uh, they're microphones over there, okay? Um, but I just wanna ask maybe one, a few more questions and then, or one question and then we'll go to the audience mm -hmm. and then if I have time. So I wanted to, sort of uh, uh, push this point again around this question of identity politics or the politics of identity. Because one of the things that is happening in the United States and elsewhere, there's this sort of global idea of people of color. We talk about you know, African Americans, uh, Latinx people, Asian Americans, it's sort of everybody together and then 
whites. That's the way the sort of people who are marginalized, disadvantaged. I'm, of course, being extremely blunt and crude here. But if we think about sort of the politics of identity, the narrative is that people of color are subordinated generally in various ways. Of course, different people of color are subjected to different kinds of. So for example, the statistics on African Americans and the healthcare system and you know, health statistics and a range of other socioeconomic indicators, et cetera. Should we sort of think, if this is a, an issue now, should we maybe reconsider how we think about the politics of identity because putting sometimes it feels like putting people in the same box of this sort of box, the people of color, it flattens experiences, it universalizes experiences and doesn't recognize the real fissures and disadvantages based on color not experienced in the same way. Well, I mean, I do think that the devil's in the details. Right? and that there are ways in which folks who are not sincere always try to play games, right? So meaning they try to play games with the people of color mantle, but they can try to play games otherwise, right? And so I'm too much of an optimistic, I guess, what kind of person, you, you might not know that by anything I've just said, but um, I, still, I still believe, right? Um, in this idea of people of color coming together. Maybe because when I went to school, we still use this idea of third world coalitions. I know that's not the right way to talk no more, right? Um, but back in my day, right, we used that language. Um, and so that's, that was how I was, I was formed, and that's how I still kind of think about liberation politics. That being said, right, um, I dedicate the book um, to the late Miriam Jimenez Roman, who was the, one of the innovators, right, behind the whole idea of Afro-Latino studies, right, as, a, as, a, as an important space uh, for the production of knowledge. And a former uh, programming director uh, here at the uh, Schomburg Center. Uh, so what Miriam uh, was famous for saying is like, you know, some colors, coloreds, are more colored than others, right? <laughs> and we can never lose sight of that. Right? So this idea that someone comes from Argentina, black, because they got black ones there too, but let's, call, let's say white, a white Argentinian, comes to live in the United States, right, and then gets counted as Latino, right, or calls themselves Latino, and then with that Latino mantle, then says, oh, and I can't possibly be discriminatory because I'm a person of color too, right, that is something that needs to be closely examined, right? So it's not so much that I don't, I think the po people of color hides too much. I think that people of color gets relied upon too much as if it does all the work in the phrase itself, right? So meaning the pursuit of the dream is in the action, not just in throwing the label on, right? I mean, it's just like at our jobs, we got them diversity, equity, inclusion statements, right? If all you have is a statement, that's not doing the work, right? The statement has to come along with a whole system of policies and practices, right, that make diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace a reality, right? So a similar and related question, right, is this idea that the young people often say to me, oh, you know, so we're canceling Latinidad, right? For Latinidad, right, is this idea of all Latinos as having commonality Right? Um, in the way we think of people of color as well, you know, having all commonality. And oftentimes, some of them young folks, you know, they're a little more radical than I am. They're ready to cancel Latinidad, right? And, you know, to each his own, right? But I'm not advocating that either. I, I, again, me with this optimistic view. I still have this dream, right? A Simón Bolívar dream, right? That we can come all together and look at our commonalities, right? As far as people subject to colonialism and white supremacy and the like, and neoliberal politics. Uh, but Latini, that is not some, again, a label you get to cover all our mess with. It should be the dream that we know that we're trying to pursue as opposed to we're presuming a reality just from the label. The same thing goes with people of color. Thank you. Well, I think we have a group of people who already are lining up for questions, so sir. Hi, um, I just want to tell you, first of all, it's a fantastic book, 
And um, like you said, it covers all a lot of different ranges. One thing I wanted to add, R Roberto Clemente is revered by the Latin community, but what they nev have never understood, I did sports radio for 23 years. He was very close with Dr. King, and he would say, I'm black. We're from the same neighborhoods, same bad neighborhoods, eat the same bad food. The Latin community has loved him as an athlete, but has not followed his vision when it came to blacks and Latinos being together. The main thing I wanted to bring to your attention you were talking, you wrote a lot about the judges in the book and some law enforcement. I was a cop in Connecticut for 27 years. And in 91, I brought a lawsuit against the city for not hiring women and minorities. Got shot at, went through death threats and all that kind of stuff. But I won it. And they had to bring in, and they brought in mostly Latino officers. And it put me in a bind because here I was fighting against the city, going through death threats and losing my job, which I didn't. The, Latin, the guys that they brought in, they had a duality where, in talking to them, they were harder on black folks in the streets than the white cops because they knew they had that card of that they could not get prosecuted or persecuted. First of all, not only were they cops, but they were Latino cops, so they couldn't have been prejudiced. And they knew it, and it was a duality that they had. Um, and it was tough for me because I had fought the city, but it was tough for me to ass out these Latin brothers that I had. It, it was just, it was just cause I wasn't raised that way cause I knew we were always the underdog, but I was fighting against cats who I brought in and they didn't have that same mentality. But it starts below the judges, even in law enforcement themselves. And your book highlighted how many Latino officers have done some really terrible things to black folks. So the book, folks, you need to get the book. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I thought one time you said thank you. Uh, Dr. Hernandez. Thank you for, thank you. This is all illuminating and I'm looking forward to buying your book and reading it. I, um, I saw it on black Twitter <laughs> when you first started publicizing it. But um, I guess my question to you has to do with the concept of white adjacency because I feel like um, that's the other side or a, a, an undercurrent of all of this that also needs to be openly discussed. Um, I think that, you know, like you, I was raised in the, during the period of third world unity and, you know, the hope that people of color would come together and um, bring about justice. Uh, but more and more what I'm seeing is white adjacency, a drive towards that. And it, I think it comes from people realizing where power resides and wanting to be all up in that. And if they have to step on somebody else, step on somebody who has fewer advantages, people are willing, people are willing to do that. So I just wanted to hear your views on that concept, what you think about it and how it fits in with your, with your theories. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. <laughs> It brings up a couple of different uh, thoughts for me. One, it's that, it's tricky this business. Right? When people are only thinking about themselves and not thinking of a collective, then that's where white agents adjacency right, really takes hold. Right? Because if you're just thinking about how to strategically position yourself, right, and you see that being the symbolic person of color and endorsing and co-signing right, problematic policies in your job or what have you um, by the white elites uh, in that space gives you just a little bit a few more crumbs than everyone else. That's because you're only thinking about yourself, right? Um, and of course, that's a problem. But the other thing this raises for me are the ways in which Latinos, right, uh, as it relates to my work, will like to use the language, right, of white presenting 
as something that is related for them. So meaning, they'll say, well, I'm not part of this problem. Right? I don't identify as white. I just happen to be white presenting. Okay. But here's the thing. The promise of whiteness is that you don't have to racially identify. You're not a race. You're white. Right? White is not a race in their own view. Right? So this notion that you're not identifying white like a white supremacist is not quite the antidote to the problem of anti-blackness within the Latino community. Right? So here's where I, I respond, right? both to the white agency issues and then this problem with, with Latinos who say, I'm white presenting. Right? Own it. So what I mean by this. One of the many, many, many gifts right, that Kimberly Crenshaw gave us with this language of intersectionality right, is that we are encouraged to look at all the ways in which right, cleavages of power right, affect us differently depending what room we're in, who else is in the room, et cetera. Right? So simply because I identify as black doesn't mean that I'm not also responsible for taking note of when light skin privilege is happening for me and being very clear about it. That means that I take on the onus then of making sure that I am present for calling out the dark skin dynamic of subordination in whatever space I'm operating in. Just because I kind of get to skate a little bit, right? doesn't mean that I shouldn't call out. Right? My own personal identity doesn't mitigate right, the way in which I get privileged. Doesn't mean that I think it's right, but being honest about acknowledging it is part of transforming the society. Right? Um, and I think too often people get caught up in this idea of, oh, acknowledging how I'm privileged is too scary then if you think that's too scary, how are we ever going to make changes? Right? If you leave something in the dark, right? you don't shine light on it, then how are we possibly ever going to do something to change it? So that's a lot of stuff all at once, but your, your question kind of like conjured up a lot for me. <laughs> yeah. um, hello. In my opinion, at this point in my life, I would say that the entire world is standing on the backs of African Americans. Mm. And the reason I say that, you know, during the 60s, this, this idea of everybody coming together of color, beautiful idea. But the problem is we didn't look at the histories of all of these different groups. Mm. And we thought they were coming equally to the table and it was just the white master that we needed to keep at bay. Not so. At this point, I have become so frustrated. I remember in the 1990s, I wrote an article in the, a newspaper, and I got really, really beat down for that. I said, it is not true that all people are color, of color are interested in African Americans. They are not. And don't get me wrong, self-preservation is the first law of nature. So I understand one of the reasons for that. But I looked at affirmative action. I was a little girl when we were marching in the street. A very little girl, but I was out there. Affirmative action, most of the people on it are no longer African Americans. How did this happen? Um, look at Harlem Hospital. Back in the 1940s, you saw black African American nurses. Now, everybody is either white or from a different country. African Americans have been the biggest loser of Pan-Africanism that you can think of. And it's not that I'm against other people getting stuff. But the thing is, everybody's standing on the backs of African Americans. The other day, I'm listening to the program, Asians are trying to figure out how they could dismantle affirmative action. Why are you going after that? Um, most of the blacks now on affirmative action are from other Af African nations and other black nations. 
And on top of that, I would say African Americans are more disrespected on a day-to-day -day level, just going to the store, just trying to be, than any other people on the face of the earth. African Americans, everyone, every country, every color of people are standing on us, kicking us, degrading us, disrespecting us. I am so fed up with it. Every movie that comes out now, if the star is supposed to be an African-American, like pop star or somebody, the person starring in the role is not African-American. African-Americans have been beat down more than any other people on the face of the earth, and it's not just whites anymore. It is a pan-African, pan-everything. Everyone is strangling us. And I am exhausted dealing with it all. I really am. And so many African Americans during the 1960s just tried so hard with this pan-Africanism, but they didn't recognize these people in Africa don't even know you. They don't even know your struggle. They got their own struggles. They didn't come here to help us. They came here to help their own people back home and themselves. We don't have the support people pretend we do. And we're being exploited economically. A thousand businesses in the African American community are owned by foreigners. And then you wonder why African Americans are getting sick of all of this. It's so unfair. We built this country and we're the ones you're still standing on. Mm. Mm. That's very powerful. Two things I just want to point out. What that whole dynamic that you so poignantly describe to me is rooted in are these two things. One, that so much of the, you know, third world uniting together, pan-Africanism, et cetera, right, was relying on the notion, that, as you describe, right, that we were all the same. And what it didn't take into account is that whites and white ideology exists in all these other spaces. All right? So that uh, simply bringing in folks who are from other countries right, is not enough if you're not also looking at the ways in which whiteness and whites right, are seeking for the, continue to maintain right, their own elite status. Right? Uh, within racial hierarchies. So there's that. Then this then converges with very opportunistic ways of symbolically deploying integration and diversity. All right? So let's take college admissions for a moment. All right? Why this dynamic of few African Americans in many of these elite colleges, right? And mostly children of African ancestry from the African diaspora, right? children of immigrants, Caribbean. and also mixed race identified black people from the US, right? So meaning, if they check that they're multiracial, it's like an advantage. I'm just talking statistically, right? Run the numbers. What's that? That's an institution being strategic in the notion of, oh, we will be diverse, but we're not going to have any of them problematic African Americans making noise here. Okay? Uh, and that is something that we need to call out and be attentive to, right? meaning this um, symbolism, the symbolic use of diversity as opposed to true social justice practice. Right? which means being inclusive across hierarchy. Right? Lonnie Guineer, right? Gerald Torres, early pioneers in calling out these issues right? of the ways in which just college admissions for one example. We can't just leave it there. You, can, you probably see it in your workplaces. Right? They tell you they're hiring, you know, oh, we so hot, we so divorced here. Uh, and the folks that they have ascending to the power, right, right, are folks who they feel are going to toe the line in a particular way, right? And that often means n 
a symbolic inclusion of blackness, but not necessarily an African-American civil rights framed a form of identity of blackness, right? And the, these are kind of difficult and you know scary conversations to have, but I think we have to have them. And we have to call it out when we see it. I wonder if I could just add something there. You know, one of the things that you point out, you point out many things, but I just want to make a comparison about this question of affirmative action. <laughs> From my perspective, the United States Supreme Court and the law around affirmative action was flawed right from the beginning because diversity became the rationale for affirmative action, not reparations. And the reality is, as Lonnie Guinea has pointed out in her study, if you look at the people who are at the elite institutions particularly and who benefit from affirmative action, the black people are children uh, are African or Caribbean black people, not what we say, the, former the descendants of former slaves. Now, South Africa, when South Africa started thinking about affirmative action, one of the lessons that South Africa learned was that the people who don't necessarily need to benefit from affirmative action, and I'm not saying that there's something wrong with people who are not black benefiting from affirmative action, people of color, but the reality is, as you point out, the descendants of former slaves have not benefited in the way that other black people have. In South Africa, what President Mandela did, he was, you know, affirmative action is in the Constitution. And basically what it said was that anybody who was a South African in 1994 and a member of a previously disadvantaged community, meaning black people, colored Indian Africans, would benefit from affirmative action. It made it explicitly a reparations policy. Now, there was a lot of discussion around it, and many people thought that that was xenophobic. But the reality was that you have to think about who needs to benefit from affirmative action. And I'm afraid that affirmative action in the United States has missed the mark, from my perspective, tremendously for African Americans who are descendants of former slaves. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name is Antonia Manuela. Uh, I am an Afro-Puerto Rican. And from the look of my hair, you know I've seen a lot. OK? And this calling out is not only refreshing to me, it is necessary. Everybody in this room has to start calling out. And uh, we have to have more of these conversations. Um, and this calling out, the very institution that we are in is about calling out. Arturo Schomburg, when he was a little boy, an Afro, you know, Puerto Rican boy, you know, teacher told him, you, you know, you have no, no, your, your race has, has no, uh, no culture. There's nothing um, worthy about you. That's what this institute, that's how this institution started, okay? And it didn't end there. More people started calling out. All right, to, to, you know, to um, coin the phrase of calling out, this is what this is, okay? There is a book written in Spanish, out of print, a masterpiece. It took two volumes for this man to write all about Latino, anti-black, anti-black Latino. Two volumes. I was lucky to purchased one way back in 1978. I cannot find it again, except, you know, I came here and I read, I'm reading slowly volume two. And it's called Narciso Se Descubre Su Trasero. Nar, you know, Narcissus discovers his skin, his skin color. You know, goes back to that um, myth, you know, of narciss narcissism is, is not about loving yourself, but it is a healthy kind of, of identifying yourself. Looking in the, you know, I don't know if you know the story of Nas, no, you know, no, it says it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. He's looking in the river, in the water, and he sees himself for the very first time, who he is. That's what this book is about. The whole story, I mean, it, you know, there aren't enough volumes. There are two volumes, there aren't enough. So you take the mantle, 
and every other sister and brother here, take the mantle and let's start writing articles. Let's start writing books. Let's start writing about our testimonies as children, as Afro-Puerto Rican children. I got a lot of stories. And my, my voice is trembling because they hurt. They hurt a lot. And thank you. You know, I'll probably be dead and gone before another book. <laughs> you know, much, many more books come out about this topic. We cannot run away from it anymore. So thank you so much. And let's keep calling out. We have time for two more questions. So I'm going to ask you all if you could ask your question and if you have sort of more to say to Professor Hernandez to do so after the event so that we can get the two questions in. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I gave up my place because I was a little um, dislocated by the, the previous uh, person who spoke. Um, I, di I did want to say that I was born in Africa and um, I'm an educator right now. And I know many educators from Africa we are committed to uh, and, and often talk about the necessity of doing some more, uh, uh, more to uplift um, you know, African Americans. I do think that many systems in the US disadvantage um, people of African descent who were uh, from um, sort of the enslaved uh, heritage. And I am very honest about it and I try to do everything I can about it. Um, so I sort of really do not, um, appreciate it when uh, where immigrants take a, have a lot of trauma in their lives as well, um, and we're often also objects of, of tremendous hostility. Um, I've been a, I live in Harlem, I live right on the street, and I've, be, I've, I've witnessed many incidents where people are being victimized uh, simply because they are from Africa, um, and quite often by African Americans. I think we need to be more sensitive about our role, our responsibility in terms of perpetuating the negativity, um, and, and frankly, just building more coalitions as we had been, uh, as had been happening in our parents' generation, um, more of, of the third world um, mentality that we're talking about. What I wanted to ask, though, is that um, I have recently been um, a victim of, of that kind of um, the, the anti-black sentiment in higher education. I was only a, a doctoral student. Uh, I'm no longer in the school. Um, I wondered what is the standard um, for proving uh, discrimination, especially when the perpetrators are minorities, um, and in particular when they are Latino, um, what is the standard? How do you document? How do you um, uh, uh, provide the facts so that the legal system can weigh um, those facts uh, in a way that is um, reasonable? The, the short answer before you go to law school <laughs> is that, unfortunately, the United States, except in some very uh, special circumstances, demands that people prove intention to discriminate. Sort of like a mindset. Um, and of course, that's difficult because not everybody speaks out their attitudes, right? Anti blackness is not just about using the N word, right? Sometimes people don't say anything, but they're doing anti blackness in their actions, in their exclusion, right? In their ridicule, et cetera. Um, and so, unfortunately, uh, anti discrimination law in the United States, I will, you know, be the first to have to concede this, um, is really much too narrowly. Uh, circumscribed in and the, the, the demand for evidence is really quite difficult unless somebody's witnessed it unless there's a pattern of exclusion across you know several different um, uh, actors as well um, we don't make it easy right? uh, to be able to tell our story uh, of discrimination because we're asked to do it in a very uh, confined way right? I'm looking at Penny to see whether she agrees with me yes she agrees with me Um, good evening, everyone. Um, hi, Dr. Hernandez. I just want to thank you for your book, um, and also racial subjugation, sub, racial subordination in Latin America. Um, I am African American. I am married to that handsome man back there. I've been married for 37. What are we? 30 years. 37 as a couple, um, and it is scary. The calling out, and I wanted to ask about how an African-American can participate. I grew up 
in a time where it was like people of color, I'm 54, like it, we're all united. And then I started dating this really handsome guy and all of a sudden it was, oh, pito esta con la morena, right? So that was my first introduction to I'm morena. I didn't even know what that was at the time. Now, now I'm a Spanish teacher. <laughs> um, but then, um, <laughs> but then um, we attended a family barbecue and it was, uh, in-laws of his relatives, and it was a white presenting um, elderly woman who immediately just looked at me and was like, ¿Por qué se casó con ella? Like, why did he marry her? The, not even realizing, well, this woman, you know, like, why? It was an issue. But anyway, so now, as I think about this, you know, it's real, and you started it off with families, the first scene of the crime, and that it's a thing and how can African Americans participate in it? Because when I started realizing that, whoa, blackness is really different in Latin America, it almost feels like 1950s United States. And when I started kind of calling it out and pushing it, it was like, oh, you're just saying that because you're dark skin. You know, it was that kind of like perception that I'm just an angry black, yeah. Okay, I'll accept that, but there's a legitimate reason. And so in particular in academic spaces, how can people like me, because I'm totally all about this, participate um, in a way that respects differences? Like when I say that you are black, you're not black like South America, like my family's from South Carolina, right? You're not black like South Carolina African American experience, but you are a part of the diaspora. So how can we participate in ways that allow people within the diaspora to be black as blackness is for them, but still doing the work to move forward to a more egalitarian society? Mm -hmm. yeah. Your um, observations uh, reminded me that I meant to tell you all right, um, that in many respects this book is uh, like a sequel. <laughs> uh, it's a sequel to an earlier book, which I presented at the Schomburg actually back in the day, um, called Racial Subordination in Latin America. Right? Uh, and what that book did is it just looked at Latin America and the way in which anti-blackness operates in Latin America. Right? And the reason why I call Racial Innocence the sequel to that book is because what it does is it looks at how those ideas travel with migrants. Right? Meaning that when people pack up their stuff to move to a new place, right, the clothing, the records, you pack up your culture with you. You don't leave behind your racial attitudes. Those come with you too. Right? Even if you don't realize you're packing them with you. Right? If we say the food and dance and music or culture, racial attitudes are part of culture as well. Um, so, what I find, I'm hoping to offer you know, the world, so to speak, my little contribution, right, is that the two go together in the following way, right? Almost like a joint set, right? Um, and I think the Schomburg might have an old copy over somewhere here. Um, is that when we think about how the, the problem of anti-blackness manifests itself here in the United States, the folks often say, oh, well, you know, those are just antiquated ideas, or oh, it's just colorism, it's just the old folks, it's not, it's not the young people, everybody loves Bad Bunny, right? Um, it, you know, it's not the new generation, et cetera, right? And, and what is missing right, are the ways in which these attitudes are so deep, they started the family, et cetera, that what's the sort of the epitome of sort of modernity in young people? Online dating, right? Studies of online dating preferences show that Latinos sort of almost outperform white Anglo, English speaking, you know, white people, right? In their rejection of black suitors, right? They don't, they don't want to match with no black people. Right? Uh, and consider that even though those numbers, you know, that um, get examined might even be actually more stark because they study it as if Latinos were a monolith they don't pull out the Afro-Latinos, right? So meaning, right, if we were only looking at the, uh, I mean, the Afro-Latino numbers may actually suppress the true rejection of black applicants uh, within that mix. Anyway, that gets a little too social science-y and statistician-oriented. Uh, I say all that to say this. When we are looking at sort of how do we be, how do we 
come together uh, as far as looking at these attitudes, people often ask me, oh, well, you know, if somebody says they're Afro-Latino, is that them rejecting blackness? Right? Are they saying they're not black because they're saying they're Afro-Latino as opposed to saying African-American? Right? And here's the thing. The United States is so strong in their articulation that blackness only belongs to African-Americans, it, it feels like a dangerous space to assume the title right, of African-American. Afro-Latino feels like it's more respectful because it re recognizes perhaps the cultural differences, right, the linguistic differences, at the same time that it is uniting as far as blackness is concerned. Blackness in a South African mm -hmm. uh, mindset. Right? Uh, and so when people want to know, well, you know, isn't it different in Latin America? It's different in how white Latin Americans talk about it. Part one that this book is a sequel to looks at the civil rights movements of Afro-Latinos in Latin America and the way in which they are identifying as black. Not African-American, right, because they view that as just about the U.S., right, but they're identifying as Afro-descendants, connections to Africa, and the way in which it implicates them from a mode of anti-blackness. That doesn't get reported on in the United States. And so we tend to think of, oh, well, Latin America, they're all messed up. They don't understand. They don't, they don't want to identify as black, right? And, you know, this far uptown, folks will all say, oh, they are the Dominicans. They don't want to identify as black, blah, 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 right? Let's not get it twisted. Sometimes it's not going to happen. But other times it's about wanting to be careful about respect, right? As far as other people's histories and other people's ethnic origins, right? Meaning black people also have ethnicities. You know, who's the latest on Spotify these days? Strome, right? The black Belgium. That's right, en danse, right? Uh, <laughs> Allo en danse, right? In any case, um, he's super popular right now, right? Uh, and, but he's black too even if he doesn't, right, identify as African-American, right? Uh, so I guess, you know, as uh, Novella starts to bring out the hook uh, uh, to get me off the stage, uh, I, you know, I simply want to say that um, what I'm hoping is that what the, this book and the other books or whatever provide is a language and a grammar for being able to have these difficult conversations, right? And, thank, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because with the language and the grammar and the receipts <laughs> um, that are provided in both of these books, you're, better, you're sort of better empowered to have the difficult conversations rather than just only relying on your intuition or your own personal experiences, you're able to speak with the community because the community is what's being uplifted in the book. Thank you so very much. I did want to mention that your book, uh, Racial Subordination in Latin America, is available at the New York Public Library. So all you have to do is go to your local branch. If they don't have it in your branch, they can actually send it to you from another branch. So you should go ahead and request that. Also, um, for a couple of years, we hosted the Afro-Latino Festival. Um, and those programs are available online if you want to engage in more of these conversations. Um, find out the names of other incredible scholars doing some of this work. Um, someone that I met here was Dash Harris, who is on Instagram. She's a firecracker. Um, she's straight, no chaser. Sometimes you like it hot, sometimes you don't. But mm -hmm. she's someone that I recommend because she also recommends other people who are doing this work um, from various lenses. Uh, and also, with that said, I would love if you could recommend to us maybe one or two other books um, that might be of interest to us. Well, there's so, so much fabulous stuff going on. I actually have like a whole index, right, of, that gives you, you know, the, the, the literature, so the bibliography. And I, so I just want to say this, you know, the book is, it's a trade press book. It's meant to be readable and et cetera. But there's, you know, a ton of footnotes in the back, in the back. You know. um, so it doesn't disrupt the reading pleasure, right? But the reason why I did that is so that I could do this, right? So that I could give people like, a reading list. They would know where else to go. You want to know more about the Afro-Colombian perspective? It's there. You want to know more how this plays out in Miami? It's there. You want to know who's talking about it in Iowa? It's there. Um, I wanted it to also be a collective effort with respect to the production of knowledge, right? Because too often the people who are doing this in 
anthropology, sociology, et cetera, don't get the same kind of access to the space, you know, as far as public uh, intellectual speaking engagements and, and the like. Um, and so I wanted to bring them along with me because God knows I was in conversation with them, both intellectually and, you know, directly in conversation with them. Uh, so I, I won't pick anyone because there's tons of them and they're in the book. The Afro-Latino Reader, I guess, is a good place to start because yes. that's the anthology that Miriam Jimenez Román edited. Say so the name one more time, maybe a little slower for the, the folks. The Afro-Latino Reader uh, is Duke University Press, and, and it's, here on, it's here at the Schomburg, too, uh, and it's an anthology. So it's got, you know, poetry and um, fiction, and, but all kinds of ways that speak to the Afro-Latino um, identity, both within Latin America, but really here in the United States. Thank you so much, Professor Hernandez. Thank you so much, Professor Andrews. You all have been a wonderful audience. Books are available in the Schomburg shop. Uh, and Professor Hernandez will be signing her book afterwards in the lobby area. Have a good evening. Sure.